So thank you for joining us. My name is Rebecca Allison. I am the program manager with Alltech at the University of Colorado Boulder, and my pronouns are she, her. This is an Alltech faculty workshop, and Alltech is all about languages and the faculty who teach them. We provide a variety of programs, resources, and support to faculty teaching languages, as well as the students who are learning those languages. Today's workshop is collaboration, transparency, accessibility how to radically rethink the classroom and our roles within it, and is presented by Dr. Rosemary Pena and Dr. Emily Frazier Rath. Dr. Pena is the founder and president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association, BGHRA, and adjunct professor of German in the Department of Central, Eastern, and Northern European Studies at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Frazier Rath, a 2019 CU alumni, is the executive director of the BGHRA Institute, visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College, and a lecturer of German within Alltech at CU Boulder. We thank them for joining us today to share their knowledge of community-based learning and Black German studies. We ask that you remain muted while our hosts present and use the chat to ask questions. We will have time at the end to discuss. With that, I, heard, I turn it over to Dr. Pena and Dr. Frazier Rath. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh -oh. Many thanks to Rebecca Allison for inviting Emily and me to facilitate this workshop today and to the Anderson Language and Technology Center for hosting what I anticipate will be a stimulating conversation. Before we proceed further, I'd like to first take a moment to acknowledge the Leni Lenape, the indigenous people who still occupy the land, the space that we call Southern New Jersey. My residence from where I speak sits on land connected to their rich history and I understand and acknowledge my shared responsibility to communicate the ways that I, my family and my local community are implicated in the lives of native peoples. Concomitant with and in response to the development of Black German studies as an interdisciplinary research field in the US, members of the globally situated diaspora community have been rekinning in discourse and actuality for nearly three decades. My own research in Black German transnational adoption far precedes the official introduction of Black German life and history in academia. I speak from the standpoint of a Senegalese German woman and mother living in exile in America as an involuntarily naturalized citizen of the United States. I came to this country as a refugee designated by Germans as Staatenlos, stateless unclaimed by any nation. Next slide, please. Though rarely acknowledged, except in essays and articles written by me, I and the BGHRA have contributed significantly to the advancement of what was once a trendy niche topic to what is now a recognized area of research in multiple disciplines, albeit primarily in the United States. We at the BGHRA acknowledge and respect that we enjoy many privileges here that our counterparts in Central, Eastern, and Northern European countries do not. We owe much to them for their inspiration, courage, and tenacity, for their activism, research, authorship, and cultural production from which we who were discarded draw healing and strength. We recognize that this work bears a tremendous emotional cost, and we therefore expressly position ourselves as Black Germans in North America. To learn more about my perspectives on the role of social justice work in academia, I invite you to consider my blog post on the DDGC's website entitled Scholarly Activism, the Black German Heritage and Research Association, and Black German Studies in the United States. The article is a shortened version of my keynote address delivered in November 2020 for the annual Women in German Studies in the UK and Ireland conference. 
For those of you who may be yet unfamiliar, thousands of children born to German women and African-American soldiers in the wake of World War II were systematically dispelled from their motherland. We know now that among them were also the offspring of soldiers from Puerto Rico and other Caribbean countries and Africans who were living in Germany at that time. Following much public discussion, many of the children who were coded as black were adopted to the US and Denmark and were thereby heuristically dekinned and irrevocably detached from their families and culture of origin. Many, but not all the fatherless children who were left behind in Germany grew up in orphanages and foster homes. Others stayed with their mothers and extended family. The mass deportation of black German children decimated the heretofore largest community, German born black community, inflicting trauma that manifests intergenerationally in countless and for some irreparable ways. As the post war cohort reached adulthood, many living on both sides of the Atlantic began searching for their ancestral roots, origin stories, and biological kin. In the meanwhile, they discovered each other. By sharing our personal stories and consuming a growing body of memoirs and scholarly texts, we learned that a kind of eugenics informed cultural genocide had been enacted upon us. Consequently, many black Germans born in the 50s, 60s and 70s and who share their testimonies with us describe how they grew up feeling isolated in their circumstances. Regardless of where they were geographically situated, they felt variably detached from their multicultural heritages, which had been rendered invisible and unattainable to them. Like most transnational adoptees, Black Germans often wonder what their lives would have been like had they grown up in their country of origin with their biological families. Learning about the history and contemporary culture of Black people in Germany provides them and their progeny a sense of existential continuity and access to some aspects of German culture that they were deprived of growing up in their adoptive family networks. I often contemplate how different Germany might be today had all its children been allowed to stay in the country of their birth. Since 2011, the BGHRA compels the reactivation of community ties among Black Germans and diaspora as an act of resistance. We tangentially support Black German studies as a research field by hosting publicly of public events and academic conferences, providing information and resources to scholars and mentoring students. Our conferences create a unique space for multi-layered conversations among a diverse group of Black persons with different cultural roots, family backgrounds, and connections to Germany, and importantly, with the scholars who endeavor to teach and write about them. The format of the BGHRA conference is such that persons who identify as Black Germans share life narratives on panels that flank traditional academ academic presentations film screenings, and cultural performances. As reflected in the theme, Strengthening Transatlantic Connections, the inaugural event held at the German Historical Institute DC celebrated the reunification of Black Germans in diaspora. It was a momentous and highly symbolic occasion that has been lauded as a watershed moment in Black German history. On the first morning of the three-day conference, I led a delegation of Black Germans to meet with the representatives of the Congressional Black Caucus on Capitol Hill upon the invitation of Congressman Alcee Hastings of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the U.S. Helsinki Commission. These first moments on Capitol Hill in 2011 reflect the socio-political ethos in which the US adoptees and representatives of the black community in Germany were actively and publicly engaging for the first time in the US. My dear friend Noah So, a well-known activist and author of Deutschland Schwarz-Weiß, Der Alltägliche Rassismus, was our first keynote speaker. She explained, ours is a Geteilte Geschichte. 
It is our shared history which also divided us. Reflecting on the socio-psychological aspects of the systematic deportation of Germany's black children in the 1950s and 60s, so explained that subsequent generations lacked role models with whom they could identify. She spoke at length about what it means to be a black German, the impacts of subject positioning and storytelling and the importance of belonging. So's keynote was published in our conference report in its entirety and the recording is on our YouTube channel. Her words that day set the tone for me relative to the BGHRA's engagement with our diaspora community and academia, and has since informed my vision with respect to positionality. We must tell our own stories and not explain one another. Others cannot explain or represent us. Our life experiences are complex, intersectional, international, and multicultural. They cannot be so easily collectivized. To do so inevitably crafts a narrative that violently excludes and thereby reifies the historical erasure of lives deemed less interesting. This is particularly relevant to those living outside of Germany or whose life experiences contradict the prevailing academic discourse that has come to define who is and what it means to be a Black German. So spoke about this in 2011 and she reiterated it in 2018 and it resonates until today. Subsequent BGHRA conferences were held in 2012, 2013, and 2018 at Barnard College, Amherst College, and the University of Toronto, respectively. So second keynote, along with Fatima al Tayems from the Toronto event are also on our YouTube channel for your enjoyment. Our fifth conference celebrating our 10th anniversary was hosted virtually in February by my four times alma mater, Rutgers University Camden. Recordings of all the sessions are now archived with those from previous years. We know by our statistics and comments from scholars that these are being used in interdisciplinary classrooms and importantly are available for black Germans to view. But our concern in this moment is more about how our media is being taught in classrooms and in which curricular contexts. Our in-person conference planned for 2020 was postponed due to the pandemic, but transitioning to virtual education was a no brainer for us. Our strength has always been in the digital humanities. Prior to, becoming, prior to the term becoming a buzzword. Our digital archive is vast and deep, as is our virtual communication network. The imperative academic turn to online education play directly to our strengths. Our affiliation with the scholarly collective diversity, decolonization in the German, German collect curriculum, DDGC, opened many do do new doors for us and we have initiated new projects and set new goals. It was at a DDGC event that I first met Emily Frazier Rath, who I'm honored to introduce now as my dear friend and the executive director of the BGHRA. Our partnership has borne much fruit this year as exemplified by our BGHRA at Davidson College website and our All Black Lives Matter event series playlist. So at this junction, I will turn the virtual podium over to Emily so that she may tell you more about our work together from her perspective, our future aspirations as a team and how you might support our work. Emily. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And as a Colorado alum and um, as an Alltech employee, I'm, I'm very, um, happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting us uh, Rebecca and Maggie and also um, uh, but today I'm speaking as uh, Rosemary mentioned as the executive director of the BGHRA and as a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College um, 
today I realize, and we realize that there is a, are a variety of people in our audience. Some of you are members of the Black German community and deserve to know how uh, your, your lives, experiences, work, et cetera, are taught in a Black German studies classroom. Others of you are, um, are German professors or maybe students of German who are interested in teaching responsible Black German studies or integrating um, different, different parts of Black German studies into your curricula and classrooms. And so others of you are um, perhaps students or faculty in other languages um, or perhaps even other fields beyond the languages and literatures who are interested in um, some of the key words that we talked about <laughs> or wrote about in our um, explanation for this event and in the title of the event. And indeed, that's what's going to structure the second part of this presentation as I um, talk about our classroom and curricular values. These values, collaboration, transparency, and accessibility are what drive us um, at the BGHRA in, in our collaboration together. So as the BGHRA Executive Director, I work very closely with Dr. Pena. And in fact, it's through our collaboration in the classroom that um, I became the Executive Director of the BGHRA just in the last year. Uh, Dr. Pena had sent out the, via the DDGC website um, this, this um, call for interns to work at the BGHRA, students who maybe needed um, volunteer hours or uh, work credit, work study credit, or um, maybe curricular credit or payment to do outside work outside of their, their curricular endeavors. And I at Davidson, um, you know, know of some funds available for people uh, to do that. And, and so I got in touch. And it's through these conversations around what it would mean for Davidson students uh, to intern for the BJHRA and support the BJHRA um, that our conversations about other things kind of came into the fold. And what came up is that I had a class last fall, um, in the fall 2021, uh, that I wanted to teach called Black German Art and Resistance. And of course, I had put this on the curriculum. Um, I had put this, this in to, um, into the books and was preparing to teach it in the way that I thought it would make sense to teach. This was in response partially to the lack of um, Black representation in the curriculum at Davidson and in the broader German, German studies curriculum, broader humanities curriculum. Um, it was in response partially to the 2020 um, uprisings and, um, and activism around and following George Floyd's death. Um, by, by police. And it was also um, just, it, it, it was increasingly becoming an area of interest for me, um, Black German studies. So with all of these things in mind, I had put it on the books and hoped to teach it correctly. <laughs> and what I soon realized was that it would not make sense to teach without collaborating with someone whose whole life and work had been in Black German studies. And so um, it was through our conversations about interns that eventually the conversation about teaching, co-teaching a class um, at Davidson came into the fold. I secured some funding for uh, Rosemary through the experiential learning um, office here at Davidson, which I'll talk about more um, in, a, in a few, and then just went to town basically, <laughs> um, getting all sorts of funding, um, available throughout the university, throughout the college um, for to invite various guest speakers. So this was the process. And then we taught Black German Art and Resistance, German 221, last semester with eight students in English, um, partially online and partially in person, so a hybrid class. This semester, we're co-teaching another class together called Race, Gender, Migration. This class takes place in German, but also in English. Um, with our guests as all of our conversations on our YouTube channel are in English. And so these meetings with students and our guests take place in English. Okay, so let's get going with our curricular values, which, um, which have come up and sort of been um, coalesced 
as a result of these collaboration, uh, this collaboration with each other. And first, one of our values is classroom and curricular um, uh, is, is indeed uh, collaboration. So I mentioned Evenson College before. Some of you might know of them. They just lost, so they're not going to be in the, um, the NCAA men's tournament. So you won't see them there this year, but they've been in there in the past. Otherwise, you may not have heard of them. Steph Curry is probably the most famous Davidson alum. It's a small small liberal arts institution in um, the American South, so just north of Charlotte, North Carolina. It's also a prim primarily white institution or a PWI. But what's important about that is to note that though people in our classrooms often look white or are white passing and often are white, right? They also, that we don't just teach to white students, that there is a variety of people here from all over um, the country, on all over the world, um, who come from various families and various backgrounds who identify differently from each other. Second, my identity. I mentioned a little bit about you know, my educational background, but, but also that though I was trained um, in Ger the Germanic studies, uh, Germanic and Slavic studies department at, um, at Colorado, um, under the instruction of Dr. Beverly Weber, uh, who's my mentor and friend now, um, she, she taught me a lot about anti-racism and how to do anti-racist work in the humanities and in German studies in particular. Um, however, I was not trained in Black German studies. That's not her field and it was not mine. I'm still on the edge of it, I feel, in many ways. Although the executive director of the BGHRA, I'm very, I'm much more comfortable now teaching Black German studies, and that's the position I'm talking to you from today. But scholarly, um, it's still, it's still not something that I've published in, though I'm going in that direction. My expertise is in refugee activism, contemporary refugee activism in Germany, and questions of migration. Um, race and gender from that from that um, sort of perspective. So my other identity signifiers come into play at various points throughout um, throughout our collaboration and in conversation with our classes. So I should mention that last semester, our class was on Tuesday, Thursday. On Tuesdays, I typically met with the students myself. Um, on campus in person. So Davidson, like many of our other universities and colleges really value that in person, you know, get the students on campus um, so we can make money off of them for housing and tuition kind of thing. Um, and also that in-person aspect. They're very reluctant actually to move on beyond that, um, to, to talk about the values of using Zoom in the classroom to connect with communities and people and, um, uh, and, and to sort of disrupt the temporal and spatial dynamics that are necessary in the neoliberal institution to, to operate. So um, we met in person for that reason. And also what became a reason uh, for meeting in person, just me and my eight, again, white passing and white students um, was, was to have conversations about race and racism and whiteness. Um, in the space where we were not impeding on time and space that was devoted to talking to our guests, all of whom who, who identify as Black German um, or whose work intersects with shapes, influences the field of Black German studies. It is very imperative to have conversations about race and racism with people of color and Black people, obviously. But it is also sometimes an impediment um, to just frame conversations with people of color and black people um, in those terms. And we wanted to avoid that as much as possible. Though the themes of race and racism always come up or often come up, not always even, um, it is also not responsible and often a white framework to just talk to people of color through the lens of racism and race. So we want to avoid that. And on Tuesdays, often that was a conversation that we could have on campus together um, and so on. The other part of my identity that came up quite a bit um, in those Tuesday conversations, but also in the Thursday conversations when we all Zoomed as a class with Rosemary was, um, was uh, my identity as sort of 
not the typical Davidson professor, or maybe even not the typical person in academia. Though I'm not first gen in the traditional sense, my parents didn't, didn't have a traditional upbringing when it came to going to college right after school, that sort of thing. Um, my father owns and sells cemetery, mon or owns a business that sells cemetery monuments. And my mother is a recently, um, recently retired special education teacher. <laughs> Um, I do not have grandparents or aunts and uncles or great grandparents or whatever who were academics or are academics now, unlike many professors at Davidson and I'm sure other professors elsewhere. And this, this sort of outing myself as someone who doesn't belong in academia, as I was told often um, in, in my experience um, as a graduate student, you know, comes up for students who are white passing, but also not white passing as, you know, how do you belong in a space and how, how do you belong in these academic conversations? And so that was also a really useful area for that, those conversations to, to take place. Of course, on Thursdays with Dr. Pena, um, she was very open about her um, adoption history, her identity as a Black German, um, her identity as a scholar, as a mother, as all of these other things as well. And so identity and ourselves, our positionalities came in quite often in the class, continue to come up quite often in the class that we're teaching right now. And so we had this model to work with, the community-based learning model, right? What, but is it a useful framework when we're talking about collaboration? And is it the only framework? I'm gonna argue, yes, it's a useful framework, but no, not the only framework to use when talking about um, using, using the value or coalescing around the value of collaboration in, in any classroom, but particularly the language classroom. So according to the Davidson website, you know, um, community-based learning is, quote, an experience developed in partnership with nonprofit and community organizations where students connect their academic work to projects that focus on community-defined need and enhance their understanding of social, civic, and ethical issues, unquote. So um, what we have here, whoops, is um, a community defined need, right? The black German community uh, through the BGHRA through and, and because of Rosemary has really um, become sort of a, a community that has a platform in order to learn more about what it means to be black German in the global context, a global population with many different experiences that not, are not and many different works that are not always reflected in German studies curricula, even the most anti-racist and even the most Black German-centered German curricula often precludes many of the stories and narratives that we now feature on the Black German, um, uh, Black German's YouTube channel. Um, with our conversations and everything. So the community defined need is defined by Rosemary, Black German and uh, president of the VGHRA. Uh, the need being interns, which got me in the door, but also then um, the need to self-define and self, um, and, and also to disseminate information to, to and for Black Germans and with Black Germans. Um, it is also necessity to address the epistemic and epistemological violence that has taken place um, in the German studies context with regard to Black German studies, but also even more specifically within Black German studies itself. So Black German studies in the US has, you know, some of a history with the Black Germans um, actually, actually engaging um, Black German thought and work and with Black German scholars. But there's also a lot of work that is not engaging with the full version of what Black Germanness and Black Germany and Black Germans represent, mean, do, have done, etc. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And so it is continually the case that and I'm sure it's maybe similar in other subfields of your own disciplines where there is this epistemological violence going on um, where people sort of colonize various stories, um, you know, seemingly representing a diverse array of people and perspectives, but simultaneously erase 
and um, diminish other stories within with that could be part of the narrative. And that's what we're doing. So the third part of the definition of, um, of a, a community-based learning is that students take what they learn in the classroom and apply it to an outside organization. But this is where I added my question mark, because what does it mean then if what they're doing in the classroom is actually creating knowledge or co-creating knowledge that is then used um, to disrupt the very classroom dynamics and curricular dynamics that initially um, you know, brought us together. And so I want to make that argument um, that there is perhaps another layer here to community-based education. We know what community-based education looks like in an elementary school classroom or in a, home, a homeless shelter or working with the unhoused, right? But what does it look like to work with an organization like the BGHRA, whose whole purpose is to disrupt the very thing that we're trying to do, um, the epistemological sort of, um, underpinnings of institutions that we're trying to serve or maybe trying to disrupt simultaneously. So I'm going to do this um, by talking to you through my students, our students from last semester. Um, if you go to the BJHR website and click on the Academy uh, link up here <coughs> and the students link on the far right, you can go and see all of the student projects from last semester. This is one way that students created knowledge, right? They created their own projects um, with very few stipulations from us about what that meant. Um, it had to be for Black Germans and it had to engage with something from the class. That was literally it. Uh, what we'll see is that there were um, uh, lectures, there were scholarly blog posts, there was a music video um, with lots of dancing, there was a song written um, and poems written as well from, from our eight wonderful students last semester. And I'm going to show you one of these um, brief, just a brief part of this conversation now. Hey guys, oh, welcome sorry. to our discussion on intergenerational. Whoops. Um, so it's important to know who these guys are. They're really wonderful, um, really, really wonderful um, people, all of whom, oh, okay. Well, it's not working for me all of whom um, came to German studies, not as Germanists, but one of these guys, uh, Stephen came, I'll just explain what they say, uh, came to uh, German studies, to Black German, German uh, oh my God, Black German Art and Resistance, our class last semester, um, as a result of an African history class he took um, the, the semester prior. So he was he he didn't know anything about Germany. Nothing. These three don't speak German. They don't they don't know anything. They didn't know anything about German history, right? Um, but he um, is on the wrestling team, and two of his friends, Garrett and Gavin, needed an extra credit, so they they came together, and um, and so we had these three guys in this class uh, who, you know. We were, we're we we didn't know, and I I knew the other students from other German classes, and so we didn't know going into these conversations how these conversations would go with our guests. Um, and that's one thing that I want to emphasize is that there's no way to know how these how these conversations go and how these collaborations will work out. And sometimes it's just trial by error. <laughs> and actually, what it turned out to be was. A beautiful thing. What I wanted to show you in this clip, and what I urge you to watch um, on their final project again, this is Stephen, uh, Stephen Garrett and Gavin. They did a group project where they talked and engaged with Amal Abbas's concepts of transnational or transgenerational trauma. One of our guests from last semester, and um, and in this final clip that I wanted to show, but can't show, um, is they talked. They talk about. They say. Well, what will three what can, what would three white wrestlers like us have to say about this? And essentially, they go on to say, you know, it's our responsibility as as white guys with a certain amount of privilege to you know to open to help open spaces and amplify voices that are not typically heard. 
And what is more rewarding <laughs> in a class that deals with um, these topics than for three wrestling bros, and they know I call them bros, it's okay, um, you know, to say, to, to say something like that. Another example is from Katie Kowalshin. She wrote a scholarly blog post also engaging with Amala Boss um, and her work. Amala Boss is a, a psychologist, a, a trauma therapist, a play therapist. She work, does work in Germany and in um, and in Africa, in parts of Africa. And um, she writes, in my last 13 weeks in our Black German art and resistance class, I've come to question my own relationship with my attachment styles and relationships. Well, there were many conversations that sparked and inspired this blog post, the one that emboldened me the most were our class conversations with Denise Walter, Walters and Doris Walker Mayberry, who are part of this um, post-war Black German cohort, um, adoptee cohort, and Amala Voss. She goes on to say, while working uh, to fully understand Amala Boss's presentation of ideas, I did research on attachment theory's history. So her first introduction to this concept of attachment theory, which by the way, I know nothing about. Um, Dr. Pena knows a lot more as a childhood studies scholar, um, but this is something that, that came up for Katie and not, not via us necessarily, um, was when one of my close friends showed me a book which had attachment style, uh, an attachment style quiz. Naturally, I was intrigued, so I brushed off my once addicted to BuzzFeed quizzes self and filled out each bubble accordingly. My results came back as being anxiously attached, something I had expected. And then she adds a link for people reading this blog to engage with their own um, quiz. I'm not the type of person, she writes, to take a quiz and let it go. Rather, I ended up deep diving into attachment styles myself. My focus at the time was largely on better understanding myself and my experiences in past romantic relationships. Though, so throughout this article, you'll read about my own personal experiences with attachment style too. So we see here how this collaboration, bringing in Amala Bass, allowing students to explore their own sort of relationships with the knowledge that, that was coming to them. We had students read some of Amal Abbas's poems and writings prior to her visit. Amal came, they discussed um, the students and um, Amal. We recorded this conversation with their permission um, and of course included it in our archive on our, our, on our website. So this is both centering student knowledge production, their, their curiosity and engagement with people who they might not otherwise ever get to meet or talk to, and then also encouraging students to see how they can make these personal connections with um, the content. So what does collaboration, what can we learn from collaboration, what kind of questions can we consider? And what I'd urge us all to do is uh, ask these questions of ourselves and of our class. So the classes, who are you and what do you have to give? I'm not black and I'm not German and I'm not black German, but I have a platform. I have the ability to um, write grants and write grants and um, get funding for various speakers. I have the resource available to me. I also have expertise in German studies and in race and gender and sexuality in class and a master's degree in women's studies. So all of these things help boost, um, boost my, my engagement in these topics, but are not central necessarily to our topic at all. Um, but everyone has something that they can give to almost any topic. What community defined needs are there that you can use your institution's resources and your platforms to amplify and address? I really like to, um, I really find a lot of pleasure in taking money from Davidson and funneling it towards um, people whose voices matter. Um, and I encourage everyone to take their own institution's money and funnel it to places where it matters. How can you make collaboration more than, two, than a two-way street? So it's more than just the collaboration between students and, um, and the guests in the classroom. It's more than a two-way street between the BGHRA and Davidson, for example. This collaboration is multifaceted. It, it started with me and Rosemary. It went to our students. It brought in guests from the community. And, and now who is benefiting from all of this? Well, Davidson benefits because they get their name out there in all the videos. 
right? Um, our grantors benefit because they get their names out there. Um, the BGHRA obviously benefits. Um, the Black German community benefits. Our students benefit. It's kind of a win, 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 win situation. What is impeding your desire to or ability to collaborate? And I want to make the argument too that collaboration is no longer an option, just an option. It is an absolute essential part of any kind of education, but in particular hum humanities education. Writing is a collaborative process. Teaching must be a collaborative process. And if and if we're going to have a good future, it has to be a collaborative one. So there's no excuses not to collaborate. What are the obstacles? There are linguistic, technological, spatial, temporal, financial, institutional obstacles, but we gotta get rid of them. And that requires creativity. And I can share more about my um, what creative paths we have taken, um, but and, and always willing to talk to others about their own creative tasks to, to undo these obstacles. And to constantly to return to who is this work for? I want to turn to Katie again to talk a bit about transparency. And here um, in her quote, which I won't read all of, I want to point out three things. First, um, Katie in her blog post, again about attachment therapy or attachment and attachment um, theory, is self identifying here as a white American college student who was raised with two loving parents and taking on writing about Black German adoption attachment. She's positioning herself not as an expert. She says, I don't want to appear as a guide through a topic that I'm sure more people know more about than I, but instead explore how much we can attach as humans. And third, she's in inviting people as a call to action. If you're up for an adventure of exploring the theory behind what makes us act the way we do in interpersonal relationships, I invite you to continue scrolling and join me. I really like the way she writes. So in this post, we see a couple sort of characteristics of transparency. That is first self-identifying, talking about our identities and being forthright with them positioning ourselves, we can do Black German studies, you can do, you know, Black French studies, or you can study, you know, the effects of media, um, I don't know, conservative Christians in India or something. It, it doesn't matter what you study, it matters how you position yourself vis-a-vis -vis that, that topic. And to, to, to sort of self-identify out of that position is to, to cop out. Um, and to call other people in and to have a very vivid idea of what kind of thing will emerge from our engagements with um, our collaborative groups. And that is what the BGHRA Academy is all about, um, where students um, through our classroom discussions, but also our BGHRA intern program, um, also, you know, also the Black German community and simultaneously faculty who are interested in teaching Black German studies responsibly can learn, educate, and grow um, in, these, in these ways that really center transparency. Another wonderful student, all of the students are wonderful, um, Carrie Goodman, Kari Goodman um, she says that in the class, the construction of race is pinnacle to the entirety of this course. Um, that must be addressed directly instead of just focusing on racism and its effects in a Black German context. I thought this was really um, a wonderful way to highlight that sort of priority that we were talking about. We need to talk about race and racism and, and structural racism and all the racism, and we need to talk about it often and all the time. But, but we must talk about it directly and not in a in a circular way, and also um, not just focus on that when talking to other human beings, for example, our guests in our classroom, who have lives that are much more multifaceted than the framework of racism or um, racialization would, would allow us to even adventure. Um, so the students were well-versed and taught the, the history of race as an, a concept that was developed out of enlightenment thinking, right? As, as a concept that was invented um, 
and also got to talk to people from many different walks of life who have various relationships with race, racism, racialization, and who don't over, always always cent, center these things in their um, in their studies. So two things, transparency as explicitness and also transparency as honesty. Transparency as explicitness. This involves, as I just mentioned, acclimating students to conversations about race and moving us beyond these conversations to see how sometimes conversations about race and racism preclude conversations about other aspects of people's lives. And what does that require of us as instructors? Well, it means that we're unapologetic. We don't, we don't apologize about teaching critical race theory, for example, legislators be damned, right? Straightforward, honest, but also compassionate, supportive, and unflinching. Students will say things that kind of well, strike you the wrong way or whatever, but you can't flinch at that. that. That is just part of the process. And especially as a white woman talking about this stuff, I have that that privilege to, to, to sit here, take in the words and rethink how we can reframe what the students are saying or help them help them to get past or to see how they are constructing difference in a way that can be harmful and simultaneously making space for students to explore and being explicit about that um, so just a few weeks ago, I told this class that we're teaching this week on a Tuesday, I said, you know, it's going to not be always clear what, what, the, what this person has to do with this next guest that we have, or what this reading has to do with this, this film that we're watching. I'm not making, we're not making that explicit to you. What we are doing is giving you adequate information to make some of these narrative um, connections for yourself. And to be explicit about that with our students is to say, is to say too, that there's no one narrative inherent in the class's structure. So it's up to you to make your own connections. To create a narrative is to create violence um, and to create whether we like that or not, to include something on the syllabus is to also exclude things. And to be transparent and open about that is to give your students some agency. <coughs> One of our students wrote about this as a critique, and this is on the blog. So this is public, right? Um, so she wrote, this is Kari again. Well, both films were wonderful and I'm grateful to have met with such amazing creators. This course could have been more effective with a brief overview of the themes of each film prior to us watching them and then jumping right into discussions with the creators. The art we examined in the course touch a variety of themes which can be overwhelming without a brief synopsis before them. So yes, although there is sometimes pedagogical value in in you know, introducing something, there's also pedagogical value in throwing something at students and letting them, letting them learn for themselves. But just know that they'll probably feel overwhelmed sometimes. So the questions for transparency to consider, how can you be explicit about various players' roles in your collaborative process in your class, right? Um, what are your roles as an instructor and your students' roles and if you have guests and that sort of thing? If you're working with a community organization, ex explicitness is key. How can you use your areas of expertise and also decenter them and be explicit about that? When we talked about hip hop in class, I told my students, listen, I, I saw the documentary on Dr. Dre and that's like the extent of my knowledge about hip hop. I don't study it. I, I know very little. I've read a few things here and there but you need to tell me. And then one of our students, Raphael, got and stood up and gave us a literal 15 minute lecture about the history of hip hop. So you give students that space and they will deliver. When, you, are, when are you planning to have the transparency talk with your students? So including a conversation about why the syllabus looks the way it does. I do this every semester now, it's super fun to talk about constraints both temporally. We, we only have so much time but also I want to forefront this voice. I'm not talking about Maya Yim this semester, a famous black German poet, because every other German class and black German class will talk about Maya Yim. And although she's black German, extremely important, 
let's talk about Amala Vass or Imani Jones Pugh and see how her work also speaks to the work of my IE. And what do your feedback loops look like? Obviously, there are public feedback loops, there are private anonymous ones via evaluations. <coughs> and we had students write letters, um, not justifying their grades, but as part of the ungrading process, which allows them to then um, to talk about their development throughout the class, what they learned, and so on and so forth. So this is also Kari who created this um, wonderful little, um, uh, um, what is that called, graphic. Also saying that this class challenges our understanding of knowledge and expectations of higher education while decolonizing German studies. So you can see the variety of things that we engage with in the class. And of course, um, all of our evidence of those conversations are free and public and open on our Black Germans uh, YouTube channel. I'm nearing the end of my presentation, but of course I wanna to touch on accessibility, which many of us are familiar with, um, the values of accessibility. <coughs> but what does it mean in a class like this? Of course, it means universal design. Of course, it means um, addressing people's visual and hearing needs. Of course, it means all of this, but it also means making materials accessible to the communities that we are serving and we are serving the Black German community. Um, so a few things to point out, multiple access point for multiple learners. Every single one of our guests and every single one of our readings, our films can have multiple access points and always do. Texts always have multiple access points. So how can you create a way for your students to take their pre-knowledge, their things that they already know, and come in and access the text or talk to the speaker and make that human connection. That's really one of our primary goals. Um, varied instruction, of course, ample time to reflect in multiple ways of doing so. We also don't grade in this class. I don't grade anyways anymore. Um, you use un, we use ungrading and liberatory practice, which I'm happy to talk about more. Um, but essentially, the letters that I told you about serve as, um, you know, hi, doctors Fraser Rath and Pena. This is what I learned in the class. This is my development. This is what I thought went well. This is what I thought didn't go well. This is what I would like to work on for myself. You know, this is these are the connections I made for myself. Um, throughout the class and so on and so forth. Um, and at the very, very end, you know, maybe you give me an A. You can always increase the grade for someone who underestimates their own abilities and, um, and that's it. You, you cannot decrease a, gate, uh, a grade in ungrading. Again, something I can talk about later. And co-creating a collaborative space. So questions to think about with regard to accessibility. To whom is the knowledge produced in your course accessible and for what purposes? Um, how can you think about the permeability of your classroom's borders in new ways? So it doesn't have to be experiential learning or community-based learning like, like, like we've engaged with, um, but maybe these principles of accessibility, trans uh, transparency, <coughs> and um, and collaboration can, can help you think of new ways to break down those borders of the classroom. If grading is required in your course, how can you instead implement the principles of on grading, which I'm super a fan of and an advocate for, and again, I can send all the things to you if you're interested. And where do you give space in your curriculum for students to make real human connections between themselves and others, not like them? And with that, I'm going to leave you with actually, and I really encourage you to listen to his song um, called Human Stories that he wrote and um, performed. This is Pat Keel. He's also one of our interns now as a result of this class. He works now. Um, <coughs> he does his volunteer hours for his scholarship um, at Davidson for the BGHRA. And he writes, in the chorus, I aim to first ask a question and then provide an answer. Once you start to question who you are and the people around you, who they are, you start to see the similarities and differences in their stories and yours. It's your choice, what you choose to take away from their story and how much you want to relate. We can surprise ourselves by how much we can learn from others. I believe it's always worth your time to hear the story and discover those differences and similarities. 
So with that, we thank you very much uh, for, for being here today and listening and engaging. And I'm so excited um, to, to hear questions. I know we have just a few minutes, but I'm, I'm also available beyond, um, beyond this time and beyond today. Thank you so much, Dr. Pena and Dr. Fraser Rath for sharing everything that you did today about your work in the classroom and in the, um, the academy. I want to uh, just summarize a few things and people feel free to put questions in the chat. You can use the chat privately message those questions or chat them to everyone. Uh, so about the BGHRA mission, I think it's incredible that you are giving back a piece of the heritage that was stolen and to give space to black German scholarship. I was able to attend a few of the presentations through the, the workshops that the BGRHA has put on and it is truly impactful to hear directly from black Germans about their experience and from these black German scholars about the work that they are doing within this space. So I encourage you all to engage in that. Um, Emily, I love that you're being a role model for how others can engage with this work and be an informed advocate when it can feel scary or I'm unsure, how do I even start with this when I have no knowledge of this space? So I really appreciate your story of how you shared how you went about this. Uh, the collaboration piece of being very intentional about identity, positionality, belonging, amplifying voices and giving space to others, putting students in the research seat and directly connecting with those scholars is so valuable. I would love to see that in every classroom. Um, how, how amazing is it if we can not just tell them about what's happening, but have those students directly connect with the people who are creating this knowledge. And making a difference, using your knowledge and resources to support initiatives like this, seeking mutual benefit, using creativity to overcome obstacles and being a, it's key to think about continually considering who is this work for? That's really helpful to keep in mind as well as the transparency piece, being unapologetic and honest with this work and giving opportunity to students to have this kind of discourse. And finally, to have that accessibility always in mind via a variety of methods. So I see we have a few questions in the chat and I'll let our presenters answer. Yes, I see the first question um, from Anne is about um, un ungrading and um, what guidelines I give to students. I shared um, the first part of a syllabus that was not for um, Black German studies, but for um, or um, a memory culture class. And you see how like every every assignment is connected to a learning objective very explicitly so and then at the bottom sort of a more in-depth explanation of what ungrading is and how it should benefit um benefit students uh so hopefully that will be helpful i i'm trying to find other things as well i have a whole bunch um and i'm if you could send me an email i can also share all of um, my files and resources on that Here's my email address. And I'm gonna put in the chat just a few links that may be helpful for anyone who needs to leave right now. I uh, put in the chat the link to the BGHRA website so you can learn more about their organization. You can subscribe to Altic if you'd like to learn more about us and get news from us. Faculty Learning, we have another event <clears throat> coming up tomorrow, March 15th. It's our second language acquisition reading group, and it will discuss the multiliteracies framework. And then we also in welcome you to share your feedback about this presentation, and that will also help us inform how we form future workshops. So those are in the chat right now. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Pena, Dr. Fraser Rath for your time and sharing your expertise on this topic. I know that I feel emboldened to become more of an expert on this area and to be an advocate for this very important work that you are both doing. So thank you so much for what you're doing and for sharing your time today.